on his work all along. Of course. Yes. Um, and one of the things that struck me, The Big C, and I wonder as I wander, his two books about traveling, I came across in the library as a teenager, and I knew that he was the writer for me because this is exactly what I wanted to do. The Big C meaning to travel, you know. I wonder, I wonder as I wander. That, that struck me as just the most marvelous life that one could possibly have and also be a writer, you see. So he was someone that I admired from early on. From early. Triangular Road is yes. the name of your memoir. What yes. are the three points? The three points are, in a sense, what defines me. Um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, <clears throat> USA. So that is very much there. My parents came from a tiny, tiny island in the Caribbean um, called Barbados. That's the second link. And then I was invited um, some years ago to visit Africa and saw, just as I was doing research for the trip, uh, looking at maps, saw that Barbados was the first point, this little tiny island, was the first point for many of the slave ships coming from the Gold Coast. So there are the three points that define me. How did it change you having actually... Good evening, and welcome to Backstage Stories on listener-supported WBAI New York. I'm Marcia Pendleton, your host, and you just heard an excerpt from an interview with Paul Marshall, the acclaimed Brooklyn-born and bred writer. She makes the perfect introduction for tonight's <laughs> program that focuses on the arts and cultural landscape in the People's Republic of Brooklyn. With us tonight are two Brooklyn cultural icons, Dr. Brenda M. Green, founder and executive director of the Center for Black Literature at Medgar Evers College, CUNY, and Dr. Shagun Shabaka, chair and coordinator of the International African Arts Festival. They are both educational leaders, activists, and lifelong residents of Brooklyn. Welcome, Brenda, and welcome, Shagun. Thank you for being Thank with you. us today. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. Yes, it's such a pleasure. It was so nice hearing, hearing Paul Marshall's voice, too. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. I figured uh, since we were focusing on Brooklyn this evening, everybody seems to think that Harlem is it. And as much as I love Harlem and its institutions, being someone who moved to Brooklyn from another place, I found it one of the most enriching places on earth, uh, filled with amazing artists from all over the diaspora. And I have since found out that Brooklyn is home to the largest number of people from the African diaspora in the United States. So I said, mm -hmm. well, I believe that I found my tribe. I'm in the right place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm from Philadelphia. And uh, so I think, Shagun, we have a lot to talk about with, with Philly and the fact that you went to Temple University. Yes. Uh, I have plenty of friends who went to Temple, who teach at Temple. So we can talk a, a little bit about that later. Um, but I would like to know a bit about who you are and where you're from. Um, Brenda, we can start with you. Thank you again for inviting me. And I am currently a Brooklynite. Mm -hmm. I've lived in Brooklyn most of my life. Uh, spent the early parts of my childhood in Queens in Springfield Gardens. And we moved to Brooklyn in, um, I think, 1961. Mm -hmm. I, was, I started junior high school. I went to junior high school in Brooklyn, Walt Whitman Junior High School. And then I went to Erasmus Hall. The hall beats them all. And then I uh, went to New York University. I got my bachelor's degree in, in the teaching of English. I, um, ended up, I got married and then got my master's degree in, the, in teaching of reading and then my PhD back at NYU in the um, teaching of, of English with a focus on composition and rhetoric. 
And then I came to Maker Everest College, and that was a turning point in my life. I came to Maker Everest College in 1980. So I have been there over 40 years. Uh, my sons only know me as working at Maker Everest College. They, I used to have the school bus when they were at um, Junior Academy, drop them off at the, at the college and, and pick them up. And so Maker Everest College has been my home. Um, it's where I decided I would pursue my doctoral degree. It's um, something I've always wanted. I always knew that I wanted to teach and to have an impact on educated, education. And so Maker Everest College gave me a way to do that. I um, was able to have a lot of leadership positions. I teach. I founded the Center for Black Literature. I direct the National Black Writers <coughs> Conference. It's just been a wonderful place for me and also a place because it's what um, Major Owens would say is a CUNY University, very much connected to the community. So I've always been involved with partnering with organizations and, and with the community. And so the, the, the center right now is my baby. You know, okay. that's, that's what I founded. All right. And Shegun? Uh, yes, I uh, appreciate what you've asked. Sister Marcia, if I understand correctly, I'm struggling with this Zoom. I lost my view of it. But uh, my problem, my uh, computer is giving me some problems and I'm not that tech savvy. Yes, I'm a native New Yorker. I was born in uh, Manhattan. Uh, my family was in, uh, we lived on 113th Street and uh, I guess they called it East Harlem, Park Avenue. I have very uh, faint memories of it, but I do have some memories. And when I was about three, I, we moved to Brooklyn. Uh, my parents are from uh, North Carolina and Georgia. And uh, I grew up in Brownsville in the Howard houses. And I went to school in Brownsville and I went to high school uh, uh, in Bed-Stuy here at Boys High. Mm -hmm. Um, I graduated uh, and went away very briefly and came back and worked as a para professional in Brownsville, uh, teaching, uh, you know, uh, working with uh, the drug prevention programs and other work. And then I joined the East organization uh, when I was about 20, 1970 and worked at the East, volunteered initially at the East while I was still working in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, as well as going to Brooklyn College. And uh, I was uh, asked by Brother G. Tuwayusi mm -hmm. to uh, come on uh, full-time at the East. And I, uh, I left Brooklyn, I had less than a year ago, I left Brooklyn College and went to work at the East and I worked there for 15, 20 years. And uh, I also um, went back to school in the 80s and finished my BA and then continued on to uh, Temple University where I did my master's and PhD in Africa, Africana or African-American studies. Uh, and uh, during that time, I uh, worked full-time in education while I was commuting to Temple and also uh, Worked, still was working with uh, what was left of the East and the, uh, and the International African Arts Festival. So um, it's been now 50 years plus. Okay. And, and I don't regret, regret one moment of it. If, there, if I had the opportunity, of course, there are a few things I would uh, do, but those are a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percentage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you both talked about the, a little bit about the organizations that you are synonymous with. Um, Brenda, you with the Center <clears throat> for Black Literature and Shagun, you with the International African Arts Festival. How and why did you begin those particular organizations? And what void were you, 
were you trying to fill and what void do you continue to fill? Okay. Um, Brenda, we can start with you. Okay, thank you, thank you. So um, I was coordinating the, the National Black Writers Conference, which began in 1986. It was the vision of the late John Oliver Killens. And um, I worked as coordinator of the conference. Elizabeth Nunez then was director of the conference. And the conference at that time was held in what was called the humanities division of the college. And it was held in 1988, 1991, 96, 2000. Uh, during that time, it's, it was not, um, we were not able to realize the vision of John Oliver Killens to host the conference every year. So there were several things that I did during that time. In 2000, I took a sabbatical and while on sabbatical, I worked on a proposal to found the Center for Black Literature. I also worked on a proposal to found um, the English department. When I came back in 2002, I had the proposal for the Center for Black Literature was accepted by CUNY. And so that's when we started the Center for Black Literature. The Center for Black Literature became a way to institutionalize the National Black Writers Conference at McGurvis College. And being very, very ambitious, I said, okay, we're going to realize John Oliver Killens' vision and we're gonna hold it every year. But that was not realistic when you want to do a major conference with 50, 60 writers every year. So we began to hold it every other year and we held a one day symposium on alternate years. The Center for Black Literature was really modeled after the Gwendolyn Brooks Center for Creative Writing and Black Culture and Black Literature in, at Chicago State University. And that was founded by the poet, um, founder, institution builder, Hakeem Haboudi. And so we decided that in addition to having the National Black Writers Conference, we would support writers <laughs> by having writers workshops, by having a major youth program that really connected students to, and young people to, to literature and to books. Uh, while I was on sabbatical, I also managed <laughs> a bookstore that was um, bought by my son, Talib Kweli and uh, Yasin Bey, formerly Most Deaf. I learned a lot about books, about book signings. I ended up meeting uh, many more authors. And one of the things we used to do was hold these, um, so what you would call open mic sessions. Um, uh, we call them foundations. And when I saw what young people were doing with poetry and, and um, the way they use language. And, and these were people, these were young people who when, were turned off by schools, who their schools were not feeding their spirits, the schools were not feeding their imagination, but they could come into Nkuru and just come out with these poems. And you know, this, the, this, the heart, height of the spoken word was in. And I said, we need to get this into the schools because again, I have been trained to be um, an English uh, teacher and, and faculty member. And what I saw was missing in the schools was that we were not engaging young people in the way that we could. We were not giving them meaningful um, ways to, to really become excited about literature. And I saw young people becoming excited about literature. So I wrote a proposal and we started a spoken word component as one of the programs at the Center for Black Literature. And we took that into the schools and we began, we worked with teachers to show them how they could teach the spoken word in their classrooms. So the Center for Black Literature really became a way of supporting writers, as I said, through workshops, through our conferences, through our youth programs. We started, we wanted to pay tribute to John Oliver Killens. We started the John Oliver Killens reading series. We also had a workshop. We, we, we partnered with two organizations, the North Country Retreat for Writers of Color and the Payton Institute. And we offered a writer's workshop. There were no writer's workshops at that time for, for people of color. 
And then I also had an opportunity to start a radio show um, called Writers on Writing, where I had an opportunity to interview writers. So the center has all of these arms. Um, and we also have a journal, we publish writers, we, we offer people opportunities to talk about their scholarship. So we're, we are serving and promoting black writers throughout the African diaspora, the research and the programs and very way, varied ways and it's intergenerational. And um, all I see us doing now is building on what we have, but that was the impetus. And so now the, the goal is to commit that is sustained and we do that in a variety of ways through fundraising, through grants, um, always are looking for ways to build. Um, and we found that it's important to partner with other organizations also. Okay. And we try to create a win-win situation. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit later because I think partnering, strategic partnerships are important. They are extraordinarily important. And, and that's how we get through times like we are going through right now. Uh, Shagun, can you tell us about uh, the International African Arts Festival? Uh, you mentioned earlier that it's about to celebrate its 50th anniversary. Congratulations. And Thank you. so tell us how you got to 50. <laughs> Um, well, the East and the festival comes out of the struggle for uh, community control in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, Brother G2, and many of the uh, young brothers and sisters that founded the East and were involved in the African American Students Association um, were waging a struggle where uh, they wanted to have the community have control over the education of young people. And so you had brothers and sisters like uh, G2AUC, Herman Ferguson, Al Van, uh, and a host of other uh, community people in uh, really Ocean Hill, Brownsville, uh, and also uh, other districts around the city uh, attempting to exercise what you would think would be a natural uh, process in a democratic society where people can uh, exercise some level of control over their, uh, the education of their children. But uh, for African people in this country, that is not the case. We are continuously treated as Malcolm said, as second class citizens. And so when they wage this struggle, uh, after the, the city had initially okayed it uh, and then reneged on it, uh, there was uh, some kind of like reflecting and people had to make some decisions. And one of those decisions was to build an independent uh, uh, black institution. Uh, at that time, the uh, country as we know, in the late 60s and early 70s was a mess with black power, the movement for black power. That is as defined by uh, the organization US and the Kawaita philosophy that the East would adopt was uh, self-respect, self-determination and self-defense. And those were the uh, three prone thrusts of the Black Power Movement that we uh, used. Uh, I'm so sorry, uh, Shagun, but I can hear um, people in the background. Uh, okay. Yeah, we, we can hear people in the background. Okay, I'm sorry, they out in the... Hold on one second. <laughs> Ellen. <laughs> oh, God. One second. Okay, um, while we're uh, waiting for that, um, uh, Brenda, can you? Um... I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, All right, I'm... so continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so uh, at the East, uh, when the East was formed in 1969 by students from the African American Student Students Association and uh, the uh, 
some of the main people from ASA, primarily uh, Brother G. Tuwiyusi, who was the advisor to the African American Students Association. And the African American Students Association, uh, they were mass organizers. These were young students. They had a chapter in every high school, public high school in New York City. That's the level of organization that took place. And so as a high school student, I knew some of them and I interacted with some of them. And even when I went away briefly to college, I was interacting with them and G2 came to speak at the school. So uh, when I came back, I had, in high school, I was a student of black history. I had my first uh, black history course in high school. Mm -hmm. I also studied Swahili in high school. And so, um, and, and of course, uh, African culture. So I have, I was already in this mode and I was already conscious and I had been a victim of uh, mob or, or white vigilante violence and police brutality uh, in elementary, junior high school, high school. So I was already, you know, conscious of being African and what it meant in this society. And so when I came back, the call back then was all of our people need to be in an organization. So on my mind in 1970 was get a job and join an organization. And those were the first things I did that spring. And uh, I came to the East and the East, uh, you know, was doing a lot of good positive work with the school, with the culture center, with the jazz sets, with community organizing, with building institutions and businesses that service the community. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, the East was the black power organization of New York, if not the East Coast. You had other groups that were strong, but in New York City, I would dare to say that I don't think there was an organization as powerful as the East in terms of the Black Power movement. And so we brought to fruition and materialized the ideas with the institutions that we developed from daycare to, to community organizing, newspaper, uh, uh, printing services, a whole host of services that uh, you know, the community uh, utilized and looked forward to, as well as uh, being involved in all the serious struggles, whether it was police brutality, education. I mean, I remember uh, going to meetings around principals that were carrying on in racist manners, and then it was one of the same principals I had in high school. And, wow. you know, they just transferred them to another place, like the police. Okay. Same kind of thing. And so, um, I'm sorry, I can't turn this off without it uh, ringing here. Um, so, uh, you know, we were involved. If, if even I remember going with G to a meeting to talk with elected officials about too much salt being in the cheese that seniors and other people in our community was getting. You know, we were dealing with all the issues that were affecting our community. And, and so, so how did that, how did all of that come together to um, create the festival? festival? You know, okay. to create the oh, festival. Yes. How Thank did you. the festival start? So the festival was an outgrowth of the Uhuru Sasa Shule, which the, uh, the East had formed, which was uh, one of the early institutions that started in uh, the winter of 1970. Uh, right after the, the 1969 opening of the East, the next year that, that uh, winter, the school started. And one of the ways that uh, we raised money and at the same time wanted to celebrate the, the school year in 1971 was through the International African Arts Festival, which started on Tin Claver Place as a small event uh, with uh, a couple of thousand people, a few dozen vendors, and it was a success. And so it continued to grow. 
uh, through those early years until about 76, 77, we went to Boys and Girls High School. And, and at first at Boys and Girls High, if anybody remembers, we were underneath. We weren't on the field yet. We had not yet expanded. And then we expanded on the field uh, a couple of years later, and we were at Boys and Girls for about 25 years. And in 2003, we went to our current location at uh, Commodore Barry Park. But before even we went there, we, we, you know, we had issues because what happened was uh, Bloomberg had funded several projects around um, renovating high school fields. And so when he did that, part of the regulations were that uh, you could not utilize the field for any community activities. It was just for sports. And so that precluded our continuing to be able to be at Boys and Girls. And at the same time, we were you know, expanding, but that was a, a flaw in that policy because I used to go to the field myself and work out and run. And a lot of seniors who couldn't leave the community or people who didn't have the means to leave and go to other facilities, you know, and we need health more than anything in our community. And uh, that like closed a door to the community being able to uh, have that facility and service. And then it was restricted to certain hours. And so for us, it was, you know, a move to, uh, to another facility and many people, you know, in the community wondered why we left. It wasn't because we wanted to leave. In fact, as we speak, we're looking at uh, wor working with other groups to bring back the uh, festival or a uh, similar event, not the festival itself, but uh, working with people to do uh, duplicate the event uh, and bring it back. Uh, again. Uh, yeah. To bring it back to the community, uh, because yeah. what it sounds like is that you were definitely, uh, the festival was definitely a victim of um, gentrification. Uh, when they, uh, when people make decisions uh, about communities that uh, they don't live in or they come to the community and decide that um, it needs to be their way. Uh, However, um, I became involved, really and truly involved with the festival when you uh, at Commodore Barry uh, Park, mm -hmm. where yes. you are now. And it has always been uh, big and beautiful and vibrant. And I look forward to the 50th anniversary of the festival. Uh, describe Brooklyn's arts and culture landscape and the role that you play in it? Anyone can, can answer this question. Brenda, you wanna start? I, I just wanna start. I when As I listen to you talk, mm -hmm. Sagon, I just wonder why our paths didn't meet earlier because I used to go to the East when I was in, in college. That was one of the places we went on the weekends to listen to jazz, Gary Bartz, Farrell Sanders. Um, my, my children, actually, their first school was where you see Shule with Ayanna Johnson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we didn't, we didn't go to, they didn't go to Yurohusasa. I was looking at some photos, you know, they wore the daishikis and we were really into supporting, into supporting the culture. You know, there was mm -hmm. the cultural nationalists. There were the, the ones who were more than Marxists and we were into supporting the culture. And I remember when it was on a uh, Claver place, it feels like our, our lives should have uh, touched earlier. But I, I, I think that, um, you know, just going back to the point that Marcia made is, is what happened. Um, why did they have to move from, uh, from Boys and Girls High? It was, it was growing, it was growing too big. And it was almost like, it felt like someone says, we need to get control over this. This is getting out of hand. You had people coming from all over the world to, to uh, make sure they were part of it. And it was really an extension of what began mm -hmm. as part of the whole cultural arts movement that came out of the black arts movement where you would have people come together with music and dance and poetry and you'd have the vendors and that ex the, the International Arts Festival expanded that and um, you know just became um, really natural. So now we have you know, looking at um, 
what we're doing at the Center for Black Literature, that becomes another arm. In fact, when we advertise it, we advertise it and we support it as a community gathering. It's a place where we also have vendors and we have poetry. And I always like to remember, uh, Sonia Sanchez said, when you come to the National Black Writers Conference, you check your ego at, a, at the door. One of the things um, we, we have with COVID, we haven't been able to have that sense of community that's so important where people are talking to each other and networking and mingling. I remember Walter Mosley walking around with his manuscript in his hand before he ever published. You know, we, we, had, we just celebrated the symposium with um, Paul Marshall, who you, were, you started the program with, with the people who studied her, Mary Emma Graham. So we had scholars and, and poets and writers coming together and just celebrating the word. I remember when, when Alice Walker came to one of our conferences and she, it, people, were, it was so crowded. She said, no, we're gonna do this like we're home, right? You know, so she had people, people who were in the auditorium, you know, sit on the ground. Those kinds of gatherings are so important for sustaining the spirit, for looking at the legacy and for building on that. And, and we have to find ways to ensure that we continue to do that. So we're very excited. You're approaching 50 years. We're approaching um, you, 20 years. This will be our 20, 20th year. And um, just had to find a way to celebrate that. Um, we, you're saying Black arts. So what's interesting is that everybody is doing something Black. You know, I was on, <laughs> you know, you have the Black, the New York Public Library just had Black literature panel. They had four panels on Black literature. They traced Black literature going back to the 1600s and coming up to the present. They had four programs. Um, that's that's um, one thing, but organizations like the Brooklyn Public Library, the Center for Fiction, I have to say, at least they're coming to us. They're seeing, seeing the Center for Black Literature as having experts in Black literature and they're coming to us and we're doing um, we're, we're engaged in partnerships, um, Pan America. So because of this time we're in, we've been able to leverage that to create partnerships where organizations that are not black can also support, um, support our writers and black writers, but we can also expand the audience because really, we should not only be talking to each other, we should be talking to the world and to the country. You know, everybody should know about um, Black literature and artists. Absolutely, as opposed to people, uh, particularly politicians, uh, trying to uh, shut down uh, the knowledge. This is Backstage Stories on listener-supported WBAI 99.5 FM, streaming at WBAI.org. Our guests are Dr. Brenda M. Green of the Center for Black Literature and Dr. Shayun uh, Shabaka from the International African Arts Festival. And the International African Arts Festival has had some great artists uh, on its stages. And we just want to play a little bit from uh, one of its uh, internationally renowned artists, uh, Fela Kuti. So can we hear a little bit of Zombie, Max? <clears throat> Thank you. 
And that was Zombie by Fela Kuti. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you must have some stories about that, but that's a whole other show. Mm, yes, I do. <laughs> Let me say that uh, I used to go to Fela's club and party in 1971 on my first trip to Nigeria in Africa. So we would, he, he was never there. He was traveling then. But I was there with uh, my cousin and some of her friends. And uh, we'd go there and, and uh, hang out at Fela's club. And so when I saw the play, it was just the whole, you know, whole regurgitation of that experience in the most positive way. And I saw it off Broadway before it made Broadway. Oh, I know. I, I worked on both productions. Yeah. When, when I knew when I saw that off Broadway production that it was going to Broadway. Oh, and absolutely. And when it was Broadway, I went a few times. Somebody coming from, from out of town, I, I'd say, let's go. You want to see Fela? <laughs> I, I want to go see Fela again, you know? Yeah. I just needed any excuse, but that was that was great. It was and, uh, was great position, you know? And uh, Sister... Uh, Dr. Green, Sister Brenda, uh, we probably crossed paths in the 80s or 90s um, because uh, NACO, National Association of Kawaita Organizations, used to meet at Nkuru Bookstore. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that. And, your, and Talib was managing it on the Sunday mornings when we met. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. And uh, Sister Stop Neely, was working there, and that's how that came about. So and yeah, we, yeah. then we did, we did. Yeah. So too, we, we, too many it, years, too many yeah. years. It's yeah, all it true. blurs together, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's okay, true. We're, we're going to take a, a a quick pivot um, into what we're experiencing now, coming uh, what we're hopefully coming out of now, uh, the pandemic pivot. How did the role of technology? change the way you define audience and how you reach your audiences. Um, because uh, the International African Arts Festival has programming through throughout the year. Uh, and Brenda, it is, uh, the center is, has programming uh, throughout the year. So how did you make that pivot and how did you use technology in order to do that? And, um, what practices will you keep and which ones will you leave behind, if any? <laughs> well, this, this definitely forced me to upgrade my knowledge of technology. Uh, one of the things that first that happened is that I could no longer go to the studio and do my radio program, mm -hmm. Writers on Writing. So my home became my studio. Yes. So I am doing this from my home. But I have to give kudos to my, my team and uh, April Silver, the communications and marketing director was really, really instrumental in helping us to look at how we could use um, new ways to expand um, and continue what we're doing, sustaining our programming. We also hired a virtual events manager, Simone Wow, I have to give kudos mm -hmm. to her. She is masterful at knowing how to organize virtual events. You know, I, I did not think that uh, we would have to do it, but um, so we, we, we decided that we would not stop our programming, but we would offer it virtually with the hope that we would expand our audience. It's, um, it's really forced us to be very, very, um, very, very organized and very detailed and specific with how we do programming because you are working with technology. And it's also um, forced us to think very carefully about the kind of questions we're gonna ask, um, how we're going to engage the audience. We, we spent a lot of time thinking about that. I think um, we also started a book club. We wanted to find a way to stay connected with our audience. So we started a book club. We have much more social media presence, we, we updated our website so it's more um, robust and more interactive. And I think that what we've learned, um, we, we still are working on this, is that moving forward, we will have a combination of hybrid 
and um, in-person programming. With the, as I said before, that in-person is important, I think, in, in creating that sense of community and having that spontaneity and um, having people be able to go and talk to the writers. Because as I said, we try to collapse boundaries. We don't like having the boundaries and we try to make sure there's enough space in all of our programming where there's interaction and sustained um, Q&A with the audience. So we probably will do a combination of hybrid, some part, like if we do the conference over a couple of days, parts of it will be available online and then other parts you can come in person. And I think um, it's also expanded our audience internationally more, uh, more than we had. We've had people, more people join us from Europe and from uh, the Caribbean. So we're, we're, we're looking to see how that's gonna pan out. But I, I don't think it's been so bad. It's caused us to really zero in and reflect on how we're doing it and to really make a concerted effort to do it more strategically and systematically, our programming. Uh, Dr. Shabaka, um, how has this time affected you and what you do? Well, we took a big hit financially mm -hmm. uh, because most of our finances are internally generated. That is, it, they come from our vendors and our patrons. That's 70, 80% of our budget. And so we lost 80, 70, 80% of our budget last year. But we continue to struggle and find new ways to uh, pre present and, and engage our audience. And uh, you know, a good thing can come from a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, as Sister uh, Brenda has said, we've learned new ways of doing things and we're just gonna add them on. They're add-ons now because okay. we're talking about live streaming festival. We've been doing it on a small scale, but we're bringing in a new team of people that have fantastic skills. And uh, this is another thing we need to think about, talk about, and do is that is train young people in some of these skills that are in uh, our community. And so we have been able to do uh, Zooms and we, we're still learning it, but, you know, uh, we learn it as we do it, in a sense, you know, because it's so important and we have to engage and we can't, you know, it's, it's theory and practice uh, coming to to fruition together. So we've done Zooms on birthing, politics, Kwanzaa, uh, the East Sisterhood. Dr. Santi has been on our Zoom. Dr. Karenga, uh, Professor Gloria Brown Marshall. We've done post-election analysis and we've done living will Zoom. So we, we've had Zooms, we've been doing them uh, almost every month. Last uh, festival, we did a virtual festival and we had artists uh, performing. We had artists from uh, Senegal as part of the Zoom and part of the festival last year. And uh, we had some, uh, we had live and, uh, and some we had pre-recorded. And uh, so a lot of this will be on our website in the next few weeks as we revamp it. People can go and see all of these different uh, activities we've hosted over the last uh year. And so I'm looking forward to what this uh, this uh, has offered us in terms of new challenges, you know. But uh, it was a devastating time because, you know, we lost people. I mean, I was sick with my house. We were very ill. But, you know, we we persevered. Uh, and uh, we've been we just really starting to come out of lockdown and, and uh, be in the office on a regular basis. So, uh, but I think um, we will, you'll see a new kind of outreach because people have, uh, you know, it's like adapt or die. And most of us have adapted and we're Absolutely. ready for this new era that is uh, before us. And we have to be in this mode really because of what is happening to us in this country and around the world. And this is gonna create a new level of interaction and Pan-Africanism. I absolutely agree with that. 
In speaking about the festival, uh, its 50th anniversary uh, mm -hmm. coming up, what are the dates and how can we get information about that? But before you answer the question, I have to do another station ID. This is Backstage Stories on WBAI 99.5 FM and streaming on WBAI.org. I'm Marcia Pendleton, your producer and host. And I think, oh, there he is. I thought we lost you, <laughs> Dr. Shabaka. Um, and I think he may be frozen, but I think we'll take care of that. Um, uh, I think I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? Okay, you're here. We're, you you're good. Me? You're good. So could you um, tell us when the festival is going to be and how people can get information about it and how they can uh, participate? Dr. Shabaka? Yes, thank you for the question. Okay. Uh, well, before we have festival, we, we have, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. I was saying that before we have festival, uh, we have an opening ceremony and we call that uh, ceremony libation. So on June 5th, we'll be having libation, our, our annual libation ceremony uh, at Restoration Plaza from 4 to 8 p.m. Saturday, June 5th from 4 to 8 p.m. is libation. Um, and then festival this year is going to be three days, not uh, four as we usually do or five or 10 as we've done. <laughs> We're gonna do four days and it, those days are Friday, Saturday and Sunday, July 2nd, 3rd and 4th. Okay, Saturday, I'm sorry, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. July 2nd, 3rd, and 4th will be at Commodore Barry Park live and in person again. Uh, people can find out about festival by going to our website, which is www.iaafestival.org, www.iaafestival.org. And you should be able to log on and see information. We are revamping the site as we speak, uh, and I'm not quite sure if it's up. We had a big, uh, very nice program uh, last evening where we hosted uh, uh, several of our communities and gave them awards uh, on our 52nd annual Malcolm X Black Unity Awards event. And so uh, that was a very, a very powerful program. And, and people uh, still see it? Yes, they'll be able to see it. Uh, uh, if not now, you'll be able to see it on the site in the, in the next few days because we're gonna post all of the events we've had over the last year on that site. And so you'll be able to see it. So it was a very powerful show. And so we are, we, we, we are up and running here, you know? And so uh, again, uh, we have Facebook. You can have see information on our Facebook page and our Twitter page as well as our Instagram page. You can see uh, we're posting the libation and we'll uh, soon be posting the uh, festival's details uh, because we are trying to firm up some artists right now, you know, but we have most of the package together. And so we'll have that information out in the next week or so. That sounds fantastic. And, and people, may, may I add people that are interested in vending or performing, Mm -hmm. uh, they can call the office at 718-638-6700, 718-638-6700, or you can email us at info at iaafestival.org, info at iaafestival.org. We're understaffed and undermanned and women right now, so we get a little backed up with things, you know, and all of us. Uh, as Sister Brenda said, we are learning this technology, and uh, so it's a little, uh, you know, challenging at times, and you know, slows you down. But we're getting there. You know, we're we're coming along, and we're learning to master these new uh, areas. And young people already have them down. So, you know, young people want to volunteer or 
come and help us out. We're looking for volunteers. Call the office. We need your help. Uh, one of the things I want to do, uh, I told people that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm moving up and uh, I'm not tired or anything like that, but I know I don't have another 50 years to give. So people need to learn how to do this. And we want to share this with people around the country and the world, how we are able to carry on for 50 years and bring quality family programming to our community without compromise. And so we need to learn how this is done. And that's because we are able to rely on our community. You know, as I said, our vendors and our patrons, that's who determines our, uh, our programming. And so we are able to bring things that you can't see if you don't go to a club or somewhere and, and pay uh, lots of money to see. Where can you go and have your children sit there and watch some of the greatest artists in the world? And we have to think about those kind of things in those institutions and not take them for granted. So, you know, it doesn't come, uh, it's not easy. It's a great sacrifice. And so we so have we to understand the need for these kind of experiences for our people. Uh, Dr. Green, can you tell us about what's coming up uh, for the Center for Black Literature? How do you plan to celebrate your 20th anniversary? Oh, thank you. So um, you made some really beautiful and important points about the importance of legacy. Uh, I just want to say that um, I encourage people to really go to our website and sign our newsletter. Our website is www.centerforblackliterature.org. It's www.centerforblackliterature.org. Um, we have, we are in the process now of preparing for our journal, the Killens Review of Arts and Letters. We are taking submissions um, for the, the 20th anniversary. We will have a, um, excuse me, we will be doing a, a celebra celebratory uh, programming around bringing all of our writers who we celebrated over the years together in a performance. We're in, in a, a special program which will be held in 2022 for the 20th anniversary. We also will have a national black, the 16th National Black Writers Conference, which is coming up. It's called The Beautiful Struggle. Black Writers Lighting the Way. That will be uh, next year in March, 2022. We have the book club coming up, um, book club every, every month, and we have the reading series every month. We also record uh, most of our programming. So if you go to our website, we have an extensive video collection. Uh, many of our programs are on YouTube. So if you wanna really get a sense of what we're doing, I encourage you again to go to the website and look at our videos, which um, give a great, great landscape of, of the extensive programming we do around conferences, um, readings, and um, poetry events. So I encourage you to do that. So this is, a, this is the planning. We just got off from the 15th National Black Writers Conference, so we're planning for the 16th. The summer for us is a winding down want a time where we wind down. Uh, we do have um, coming up in the fall immediately a program in celebration of John Oliver Killens. One of his books is called Minister Primarily, The Minister Primarily. And uh, we are going to be the place in Brooklyn that launches that book. It was unpublished. It's a really, really witty satire that critiques and critiques everyone, critiques black people, critiques um, colonialism, uh, African. So we're doing a big book launch in the fall around that. And we also have our Brooklyn Literary Book Festival coming out where we will be honoring um, and talking to black female writers. So it's, it's, there's a lot. So programming is, is kind of down for now, but look for it in the fall. If you want to get another sense, and I, I almost forgot this, um, we our Elders Writers Workshop is coming on. We do a, a project with Salem Presbyterian Church. And in partnership with them, we do a program where elders are telling their stories. So they will be 
reading their stories. It will be on Zoom and that's Saturday, June the 26th. Again, that's on our website. If you sign up for our newsletter, you'll get all the information. So I really want to thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to talk about what we're doing and, and what we've done over the 20 years. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Green. Thank you, Dr. Shabaka. And you'll be thank able you. to get that information on the WBAI website on the Backstage Stories archival page at uh, WBAI.org. We're going to leave you with Steady Love by India Ari, another artist who has graced the stages at the International African Arts Festival. Join us next week on Backstage Stories. That's Thursday at 9 p.m. And enjoy the rest of your week. Can